Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, PCP webinar, the climate benefits of uh, ground source heat pumps. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, three uh, speakers today, uh, industry experts on ground source heat pumps and geo exchange systems. Uh, and there'll be opportunity to uh, ask uh, questions at the end. Um, so we're just going to give, uh, wanted to give a uh, land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging that we are meeting on the lands uh, that have been inhabited by indigenous peoples for thousands of years. Long before today, there have been first peoples who have been the stewards of what we now call Canada. I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Uh, Ikli Canada's work happens across Turtle Island, which has traditionally been and is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples since time immemorial. We endeavor to listen to and learn from Indigenous peoples on an ongoing basis in the process of our work. Uh, I recognize and deeply appreciate the historic connection to this place, and I encourage you to also take a moment to recognize the historical lands on which you are joining from today. Uh, so please feel free to uh, enter your own acknowledgments in the chat box. Uh, so I just wanted to, for those of you who aren't, are, aren't familiar with our Partners for Climate Protection program, uh, we are a network of uh, over 500 Canadian municipalities from coast to coast working on climate action planning. Uh, we are a partnership between ICLE Canada and FCM, uh, providing uh, free technical uh, support and uh, capacity building resources uh, for municipalities to complete the uh, climate action uh, planning framework that we have. Um, so today we're going to be hearing from uh, three industry experts on uh, different uh, opportunities for uh, geo exchange uh, and uh, getting into a, a bit of the, the business case and uh, financials around that as well. Uh, first of all, uh, first off, we'll have uh, Matt Irvine from uh, Eden Energy presenting an overview of the technology. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, Gino DeResi from Ground Heat. We'll be uh, providing a, a range of case studies of uh, and applications for uh, geo exchange systems. And then we'll hear from uh, Jeff Hunter from Evolve Thermal, be talking specifically about the rural business case and uh, opportunities for uh, ground source heat pumps in that context. Uh, so uh, about each uh, presentation will be uh, about 20 minutes more or less, and then we'll uh, open up the uh, chat at the uh, end for um, questions. Uh, so throughout the presentation, please feel free to enter your questions in the chat box and we'll keep track of them and make sure that uh, all those questions get asked at the end. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Matt Irvine. Good afternoon, everyone. Adler, are you going to drive or do you want me to? Uh, I can, uh, let me just share the, let me share it here for you. Sure. Um, sorry, technical difficulties here. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. All right, take it away, Matt. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Irvin. I'm the geothermal sales manager at Eden Energy Equipment. And for the geothermal part of our business, we're the Ontario distributors for Water Furnace and Geostar brand equipment. Okay, next. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about a geothermal overview sort of in three categories. Uh, geothermal heat pump theory, why it works and how it works. I'm going to touch on the difference between open looped and closed loop designs or systems, I should say, and then I'll briefly go over geothermal system design at a very high level. It's not going to be in depth and it's not going to be very technical. Next. So a technology introduction for geothermal heat pump theory. Next. So where does geothermal energy come from? Geothermal energy is in essence, solar thermal energy. Um, when the sun shines every day, uh, close to 50% of that solar radiation is absorbed by the Earth. The other 50% is, is absorbed or dispersed by clouds, atmosphere, 
reflected by the Earth's surface uh, next. But as I said, the Earth does absorb almost 50% of the sun's energy every day. And six feet below grade, um, the Earth's temperature remains fairly constant between 10 and 15 degrees Celsius year round anywhere in Canada. Uh, this constant 10 to 15 degree temperature results in an unlimited source of energy and the earth loops absorb, pardon me, the earth loop absorbs this energy and transfers it to the heat pump for use into the house. house. <laughs> Next. So the geothermal system components are the geothermal heat pump uh, seen in that picture to the left, the gray box with the, the blue decorative on the front, uh, the earth loop, which can be open or closed, a closed vertical or closed horizontal. The only earth loop portion you see in this picture is in the upper right hand corner. You'll see the flow center with pipes connected that's circulating the fluid from the earth loop to the heat pump. And then of course, you're going to have your distribution system, whether that's forced air with conventional ductwork or hydronics such as in-floor radiant or low temperature um, radiant panels on the wall or elsewhere in the house. Uh, next. So a typical geothermal heat pump looks like this. Um, you've typically got the refrigeration and compressor bearing portion of the unit on the bottom. That would be the compressor, the coaxial heat exchanger. That's the heat exchanger that connects the earth loop to the heat pump, a reversing valve, a TX valve, all of the refrigeration components with the exception of, in this instance, the air coil, which is number three in that picture. That is the heat exchanger that the uh, heat pump uses to put air heat into the airstream or remove heat and moisture from the airstream and air conditioning. And of course, there's a fan in the upper section of that um, heat pump to circulate the air. Next. So a geothermal earth loop schematically looks like this. The idea is it's outside, it's five to six feet underground. Um, and, and this is what makes a geothermal system different from other heat pumps, air source heat pumps, and other conventional furnaces, be they uh, natural gas, propane, or oil. One of the most common misconceptions that I've come across in my years of doing this, and one of the most common questions I'll get from people who are trying to get more information and familiar, so familiarize themselves with how geothermal works, is they'll say, okay, so I get how this stuff works in the summer, right? Because it's 10 to 15 degrees, six feet below grade. It's much cooler than it is outside on a hot, humid day, that makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna circulate the fluid, I'm gonna blow air over that fluid in the heat pump. What I don't get is how does it work in the winter time when that ground is the same temperature, if not maybe a little bit cooler? And that's a fundamental misunderstanding that the thinking is that that's just a passive heat exchanger. Geothermal heat pumps are not passive heat exchangers. The fluid in the ground, in the pipes that is circulating act as a heat source in the winter in a heat sink in the summertime. But in essence, what the heat pump earth loop is doing is providing a very large amount of low grade heat that is brought back to the heat pump and put in contact with the refrigeration cycle where using the compressor, it is compressed into a usable amount of high grade heat. And then that heat um, is, is distributed into the network or into the ductwork, pardon me, um, in a forced air system, but it is not just a passive heat exchange process. And because we have this energy source in the wintertime underground, and we're not just burning a fuel, we're able to achieve much higher levels of efficiency. Geothermal systems are typically described as, uh, or their efficiency is described in terms of a COP, which stands for coefficient of performance. Next slide, please. So you could rate the furnace um, with a COP. A COP is simply what you got divided by what you bought. So if you have a 98% 98% high efficiency gas furnace, for every 100 units of energy you're buying, you're getting 98 of them um, into the house. So that's a 0.98 COP or 98% efficient. With COP uh, for geothermal, because we're not burning a fuel, we are not limited to 100% efficiency. We're using that heat pump to literally pump heat from outdoors to indoors and the electricity or the energy we're buying, which is electricity, is enabling us to collect and distribute more heat than we're purchasing. So we typically would get an efficiency or a COP of around four. Next slide. 
Visually, what this looks like is one unit of electricity purchased allows the system to extract up to four units of free energy from the earth. That ends up being four to five units of heating or cooling delivered into the home. And this is how geothermal systems save so much money compared to conventional, is that you are only paying for 20 to 25% of your home heating and cooling costs. The earth loop is actually extracting 75 to 80% of the required energy from your home. That 75 to 80% is that large amount of low grade heat that we are compressing into a usable amount of high grade heat. Next slide, please. So geothermal systems offer uh, a lot of benefits, actually. Uh, the one I think it's probably most well known for is its low operating cost, which results in a pretty solid return on investment in most instances. It's one system that provides all of the heating a house needs, all of the cooling a house needs, and a, a contribution of domestic hot water, typically around 50% annually. I'll get into that in a little bit more, in a little bit. Um, the geothermal systems also provide um, really superior indoor comfort because instead of blasting, you know, 140 or 150 degree Fahrenheit air out of a register off of a, a combustion furnace, um, we're going to be providing 100 or 105 degree air typically, which is still much warmer than the 70 degrees we need, but not so much warmer that it's lowering relative humidity and making the air feel excessively dry in the winter. And then also because you're blasting this hot air, you're going to get hot and cold spots and much more temperature swings in a conventional system than you would with the geothermal system. Geothermal systems are versatile for retrofits with conventional distribution, both, duct, both conventional ductwork, um, as was illustrated in that previous slide, as well as radiant systems, be they in-floor systems or radiant panels. There's no outdoor equipment, which is one of the reasons geothermal systems last considerably longer than a conventional uh, furnace or, or an outdoor condensing unit for air conditioning, because they're just not subjected to the elements um, that conventional systems can be. This also results in very low maintenance. Um, basically keep your filter clean and I would advise you know an annual checkup just to make sure that everything's okay. If there are issues developing, it's better in my opinion to find out in October than it is in the middle of January on a weekend, but you know that's uh, up to the homeowner on, in that regard. Um, geothermal systems are both quiet inside and outside. They're quiet outside because there's no outdoor equipment. Um, and they are very quiet inside. I would say if you've got a, a newer fridge in your home, that's about as loud as a geothermal system would be. And oftentimes I think newer fridges are still louder than the heat pump is operating. They offer long system life expectancy, typically 20 to 25 years, sometimes longer. And then they're environmentally friendly. There's no combustion on site and they offer zero emissions into the environment. Next slide, please. Geothermal is a very safe technology. As I've mentioned, there's no combustion required. And that, of course, eliminates the need for carbon monoxide detectors in the house, as long as you don't have a gas range or a gas fireplace. There's no risk of propane or natural gas leaks because there's none on the property. And then if you're a rural um, location using oil, it eliminates the environmental and financial risk of an oil tank. Next slide, please. So a geothermal heat pump is one system or one piece of equipment that provides 100% of the heating, 100% of the cooling, and about 50% of the domestic hot water annually. Pardon me. I would point out that that 50% domestic hot water is for an average family of four, and it is seasonally biased. What I mean by that is you're going to get a whole lot of hot water contribution in the winter time, when we, because we live in Canada, there's a whole lot of heating runtime. You will get some hot water contribution in the cooling season in the summer, just not as much because we don't spend as much time air conditioning in the summer as we do heating in the winter. And then the spring and the fall, you'll typically get a pretty marginal contribution because you're not doing a whole lot of heating or cooling. But seasonally, sorry, it is seasonally biased, but annually it would be about a 50% contribution. And then all mechanical equipment is located inside and is protected from the elements and vandalism and, and uh, you know, rodents in the neighborhood or dogs, whatever you have going on. And then standard geothermal applications are forced air using conventional ductwork or again, hydronics with radiant inflow or potentially hydronic air handlers. 
Next slide, please. So this is how typical home energy use breaks down uh, residentially in Canada. If you look, you've got the large orange chunk is space heating. So that would be a conventional furnace contributing or requiring about 60% of the annual energy. The water heating is at about 18% in that red chunk. And then various appliances, dishwasher, laundry, and the like are 14%, lighting's five, space cooling is 3%. So you can see that the lion's share of the energy consumption in the house is space heating and water heating. A lot of people are often surprised to realize that space cooling is only 3%. Um, as much as we have some hot, humid, sticky days in, in the summer, particularly in southwestern Ontario, um, on the whole, um, air conditioning is, is not a huge, uh, a huge load residentially. I'm often pointing out to people that if you have cable or satellite television at home, you're going to pay more to watch television over the summer than you would to air condition your house, even with the conventional air source heat pump um, system. Now, what I want you to pay attention to before we go to the next slide is what happens to that big orange chunk and the big red chunk. Next slide, please. That is what geothermal systems do to an energy use profile or a load profile. The space heating reduces from 60% down to 15%, water heating drops from 18 down to nine, and that earth loop outside is providing over 55% of the energy for free into that home. That is fundamentally how geothermal systems um, are able to offer such high levels of efficiency and such significant energy savings, particularly when you're comparing to propane or oil. Next slide, please. So geothermal systems offer financial benefits. Um, because they eliminate the reliance on costly fossil fuels and they provide 75% of home heating and cooling for free, geothermal systems can save up to 80% on heating and cooling costs depending on what your fuel type is and depending on what the, the cost per liter is at any given time, but it, it eliminates that volatility. And then the capital cost of a geothermal system versus a conventional HVAC system is often paid back in approximately five years, sometimes more quickly, sometimes um, uh, a little less quickly. Um, but when you're talking about eliminating a four or five or $6,000 oil or propane bill, you know, the, the several thousand dollars more that you're paying for a geothermal system over 20, 25 years is a significant savings over the life cycle of that equipment. Next slide, please. So geothermal systems offer environmental benefits because they emit zero emissions into the environment. And they also offer carbon, carbon dioxide reduction and greenhouse gas emissions reductions in that one geothermal system in a typical residence is the equivalent of removing two cars from the road annually or planting one acre of trees. If you are a household like mine, where my wife and I each have a car, it's not practical or realistic for us to think that we're going to just stop driving. Um, we just, it's, it's not realistic for us. Um, but 17 years ago, we installed a geothermal system. And for the last 17 years, that geothermal system has had the same environmental impact as if we did stop driving uh, both of our cars. Um, next slide. So open versus closed loop systems. I'm going to do a quick application comparison. Next slide. So geothermal source options come in two forms, a closed loop system, which can either be horizontal, vertical, or in a pond or lake, and then an open loop system, which is going to rely on, on a well. Next slide. So a closed loop system is one in which the loop is buried underground or in a nearby pond or lake. Virtually all closed loops are constructed from high density polyethylene, plastic pipe, or HDPE. And this HDPE pipe is designed to be buried underground and is commonly already used for natural gas and water pipelines. And then HDPE joints are thermally fused. It's basically plastic welding. And when done properly, they are essentially leak proof. Much the way when two pieces of steel are welded together, the weld becomes actually stronger than those two pieces of steel. Likewise, with, with a thermally fused plastic, that joint is actually stronger than the pipe that's being fused. Next. 
So in a closed loop system, there are no mechanical joints, no threads, no unions, no glue underground. Um, and closed loop systems are named such because the fluid is in a sealed or closed system. And properly installed earth loops have a life expectancy and often a warranty in excess of 50 years. All of the physical properties that make plastic so lousy for landfills are the exact same physical properties that make plastic so ideal for earth loops, right? It doesn't rust, it doesn't decompose, it doesn't oxidize, it doesn't otherwise break down. Pardon me, next slide. There are three basic types of closed loop systems. There's a vertical loop, which as the name suggests, you're installing the loop vertically into the ground. There's a horizontal loop, which as the name suggests, as opposed to going very deep vertically, you're going horizontally, which requires more land. And then a pond loop, which is basically a, a closed loop that takes up a smaller footprint than a horizontal loop, but does require a body of water. Next, please. The type of loop most suitable for a property depends on several factors such as property size. Um, the more space you have, or if you have a body of water, there's, there's more choice to be made. Um, future plans for the property, and what I mean for that is when you install specifically a horizontal earth loop, you're not able to build on top of that because a horizontal earth loop at a five or six foot depth requires or relies more on direct solar radiation than a vertical loop does. So it, it can't be built on. You can put gardens, trees, fields, crops, anything like that is fine. Just you can't put a building over a horizontal earth loop. Uh, the soil type, whether it's dry or moist um, or saturated, that makes a difference. And of course, the contractor excavation ability is going to be a determining factor on, on what type of earth loop is installed or can be installed. Next, please. So horizontal loops. These loops are typically buried at approximately five or six feet deep. Um, these horizontal loops are going to involve more, or sorry, involve one, but typically more trenches that are dug using a backhoe or tr chain trencher. And then the polyethylene pipes are laid and the trenches are backfilled. If you can see the sort of visual um, representation of the earth loop stretching up behind that house, imagine that that trench is five or six feet wide, five or six feet deep, and 300 feet long. And in that trench, you would get two, uh, two tons, two circuits, two tons of geothermal loop capacity. Next. So a typical Ontario home is going to require two or three trenches at approximately 1,500 square feet each. Again, that's five feet wide, 300 feet long, but would depend on the following factors. The heating and cooling loads of the building, so that would be the, the heat loss, heat gain calculations that you would do for any building to determine, you know, on the coldest day of the year, how many BTUs per hour you need versus on the warmest day of the year, how many BTUs per hour you need to remove from the building. And then the installed loop depth and loop configuration, the type of soil and soil moisture, obviously the annual climate, and then of course the heat pump efficiency also has an impact on, on loop design. Next, please. Vertical loops are holes that are bored using a vertical drilling rig. These bore holes are typically about 180 feet deep, about four inches in diameter. Depth and diameter can vary though. And a typical home would require three to five of these bore holes at about a 15 foot separation between them. Next, please. So a typical Ontario home would require three to four of these boreholes, again, about 180 feet deep and four inches in diameter, but as with horizontal loops would depend on the same following um, factors, the heat loss and heat gain calculation, the loop depth and configuration, the type of soil and moisture, the annual climate and heat pump efficiency. Next. Pond loops are again a pond, a, sorry, a pond loop is one that is installed if there's an adequately sized body of water near the home. Basically a series of closed loops can be laid out as a mat and sunk to the bottom. So shorter lengths of pipe, more densely packed than a horizontal loop. Um, but you know, for approximate purposes, residentially you're gonna want a pond that's about a half acre in eight foot deep as minimum, deeper is fine, larger is fine, um, but you do need sufficient depth in surface area to rely on that body of water as your energy source. Next. 
So in an open loop system, instead of a loop, groundwater is pumped directly through a well, from a well, through the heat exchanger of the heat pump, and then typically back into a return well. Unlike a closed loop, the water is not recirculated, and new water is always pumped through the system while operating. And open loop systems are named such because the groundwater that you're pumping through the system is open to the environment. Next. An open loop can be used if there is water of both sufficient quantity, that is to say you have enough of it, and quality, that is to say it's not full of gunk and debris and, and sediment and, and other things that are gonna cause issues in a, in a heat exchanger. The other thing to bear in mind is that the well must have enough capacity to provide adequate flow for both domestic use, that is washing hands, toilets, showers, washing dishes, and the geothermal heat pump, because the heat pump will come on anytime the house needs heating or cooling. It's not going to have any idea whether or not you're having a shower or doing dishes. And typically, a heat pump is going to require residentially somewhere between three and 10 gallons per minute when it's running, again, depending on size or capacity of the heat pump. And then open systems are also very often subject to local codes and regulations. Next. Briefly on geothermal system design, the design procedure is as follows. Next. So the geothermal system design procedure is determine the heat loss and heat gain. So calculate how many BTUs per hour you need to provide to the house in the wintertime on the coldest day, and then how many BTUs per hour you need to remove from the house on the hottest day. Based on these calculations, you would specify the appropriate heat pump size and type. So how many BTUs per hour are you looking to provide or remove? And then is the distribution system forced air or hydronic? And then you need to confirm the existing in a retrofit application or design suitable distribution um, for this heat pump to rely on, uh, whether that's ductwork size or again, low temperature radiant panels. And then once you've specified the heat pump and the distribution system, then you need to determine the appropriate loop configuration and layout, that is pipe size, number of circuits, circul circuit length, circulation pumps, and antifreeze. Next. The fundamental difference between a geothermal system and a conventional heating system is that geothermal is a furnace, an air conditioner, and an energy source, whereas a conventional system is simply a furnace, and or an air conditioner, but the energy source or fuel is purchased annually, monthly, as required for the life of the system. And then geothermal systems, because they are an energy source and because you have a heat exchanger buried outside, they must be optimized in order to achieve the efficiency, comfort, environmental benefits, and financial savings that they are capable of. Next. And I'll close. <laughs> by pointing out some of the things that people other than myself say in glowing reviews of geothermal. Natural Resources Canada says there is unlikely to be a potentially larger mitigating effect on greenhouse gas emissions and the resulting global warming impact of buildings from any other current market available, market available single technology than from geothermal. Next. The EPA south of the border says Geothermal heating and cooling systems are the most efficient, environmentally clean, and cost-effective space conditioning systems available. And finally, the David Suzuki Foundation says, geo-exchange is one of the cheapest and most reliable ways to heat and cool most buildings today. The energy savings achieved by installing a geo-exchange system are considerable. And I think that was there. That's me. And that's all I got, folks. Hey, thank you so much for that. Matt. That was super informative. Um, really great presentation. Um, uh, next up, let's going to move in right into the next uh, presentation. Uh, Gino, if you're ready, uh, I'd love for you to take it away. I'm going to set it up now. Let's see here. It's... Uh... Share. 
Okay. You guys all there? Got it. Yeah. Just want to do okay. it in the uh, presentation uh, mode there, if you can. It's the uh, bot at the bottom right next to the uh, Zoom bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just right, right next to that one, to the right of there. This Perfect. One. Yep. Great, thank you. Yeah. And uh, if you don't mind, also just starting your video, that'd be awesome. Which one? Uh, if you can just start your video, uh, if you don't mind. Okay, hold on a second. Start the video. Oh, yeah, if you're just looking for the presentation view, it's just on the bottom right there again. This one here? Uh, just to the right of there, the, the icon uh, farthest to the right. Oh, this one here? Uh, sorry, just, uh, just to the left of the Zoom bar there. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I want to get the um uh, that's it. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, the the partners for climate protection to, for having me here. And today we're gonna to look at the first of all, uh, Matthew was a was a really good presentation. Um and uh we, uh, I learned uh, keep learning a lot even after forty years. Still, so, uh, the uh, presentation today is to do with the geothermal community buildings. Um, I've been doing this for close to four, uh, more than forty years, and the actually they have a lot of communities in here, including uh, some in Ontario, where you have uh, quite a few buildings. My my name is Gina Derezzi. I'm a professional engineer with 40 years experience in, in geothermal. Um, I have over 1,500 projects in three continents. Uh, we established some offices uh, as we needed from Toronto, Vancouver, Pennsylvania, Rome, Italy, and uh, Shenzhen, China. And uh, let's see here. Um, they have the can't see, uh, I'm maybe too high here for a second. It's... So there's uh, there's two types of geothermal. The, uh, they come from the earth crust. The, they both harness and exchange, extract energy from the ground. They do it in two ways. One is the high temperature steam which generates electricity, and it's uh, most, most cases up to 5,000 meters deep. And then we have the low temperature thermal cooling heating up to uh, 400 meters deep. The high temperature, first recorded in drilling project in uh, Lardarella, Tuscany, Italy in 1904. The site has 180 wells, 150 meters deep, supplying steam for 34 plants. The well temperatures there exceed 150 C. The low temperature geothermal, which uh, Matthew explained and also we're gonna be talking about, has a constant heat of about 12 C temperatures that can be accessed almost anywhere in the ground or water, either by drilling vertically uh, 200 meters or shallow 1.2 meters, to, uh, 1.2 to two meters deep. This is using cooling and heating applications. First application goes back as far back as the 1940s, including here in Ontario, uh, 1948. This is a high temperature geothermal plant in uh, Lardella, Italy, the first plant in, in as a geothermal plant in 1904. So we're about 120 years ago was the first geothermal plant in, uh, in the world. The low temperature geothermal is almost anywhere, and it, anywhere from two meters to 300 meters deep. The pipe warranty is usually over 50 years. And as uh, Matthew explained, you have pipes in the ground that circulates water. 
in the summer it takes heat, in the winter, uh, in the uh, summer it takes cold or drops cold, and in the winter it uh, brings up heat through uh, a heat pump, heat exchanger. So you saw the, the plants um, in La Dorella of Italy, and these plants are take 10, 20 years to make, and uh, they're huge, but they make electricity. And uh, these are the plants in your basement, if it's a big house, or it could be a mechanical room for a small building. And it's locally. It could be uh, anywhere in your basement or a mechanical room. So the government project in, uh, is some examples. Uh, the town hall in King City was done a couple of years ago, here where I live in King City. Uh, community centers, uh, Barrie, Ontario, Godrich, Ontario. Uh, we did an observatory, the Dunlop Observatory in uh, in Richmond Hill back in 86. The Dunlop Observatory was the observatory that discovered the black hole. I saw there's a, there's a fellow here, Pavels Hawkins. Well, Stephen Hawkins was involved in this. And uh, he made a bet with, uh, if, you, if you Google this Dunlop Observatory, he, he did a, made a bet with... Uh, a fellow of uh, Chip, uh, somebody named Chip, and uh, he won the bet and he got a one year subscription in the Penthouse magazine. So Stephen Hawkins uh, got an award for uh, inventing the, 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 the black hole. Uh, the first theater that uh, we've ever done, the first theater in the world that we know that was done in Mercyhurst College. So theaters uh, use this. We did a, one of the first the marine museum in Erie, Pennsylvania. We did another museum here in Markham, Ontario. Libraries, uh, there's one in Erie, Pennsylvania as well. We did a lot of work in, in Erie, Pennsylvania around the 90s. Uh, utilities depot is in Milton, Ontario, courthouses in Kingston, Ontario, near the, uh, uh, near the, uh, St. Lawrence uh, College uh, and also Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Fire stations, uh, fire stations in Markham, Ontario, 2014, Georgetown. And it looks like right now this uh, Cornwall, Ontario is also is also specifying and quoting a, uh, also a fire station as well. So you so municipalities, they do uh, they do use it. police stations. Uh, you may remember the Police Academy in Toronto. Actually, the Police Academy movies that was in Toronto. Uh, these are old old buildings. They were torn down back in 2010, and or 2000, and, yeah. And then uh, it became they put up a new uh, police uh, services uh, training center. We've done two work on two jails. We've done the jail here in Toronto, South Toronto Detention Center. And also one uh, back in the 90s in State College, Pennsylvania. A uh, couple of environmental transfer stations in Ottawa and Vaughan, Ontario. And also a public transit uh, depot in Ajax, Ontario. Ice rinks. A lot of ice rinks have been done. One of the key guys in ice rinks is, uh, is Ed, uh, Ed Lorenz. He's done a lot of them in North America. We've done a couple of them in Godrich, uh, Belleville, and Barrie, Ontario. Actually, uh, Stephen Mark was also on this uh, on this call here. He was uh, working with me at the the Barrie, Ontario uh, ice rink. Uh, presently being contemplated, the four pad ice rink in Oakville, Ontario. Uh, so some low income government housing, district housing. Uh, is being contemplated right now. Uh, the cities, there's some city district buildings coming up in London and Waterloo. Other major district projects coming up now, N-Wave Ontario. This is still recent, very recent. This district idea is taken off. However, we were doing district back a long time ago. In fact, the one of the first district uh, project we did was University of Ontario campus in Oshawa, where 370 wells, 200 meters deep, 2,000 tons. It was the largest in North America at the time, 
to feed the Barit buildings, the, the original campus for uh, University of Ontario. We also did a project uh, a, couple, a few years ago, a couple of years ago in uh, using, uh, like Matthew says, using water well water uh, from the ground. And we're uh, in Waterloo, Ontario, 604 apartments, 35,000 square feet of commercial. And again, that was the largest, Canada, Canadian largest water source, uh, and still is. But the one that's interesting as well is the in Rome, Italy. In Rome, Italy, we had an office in, in Rome for about uh, 14 years. And we did uh, uh, a central system, a 10,000 square foot mechanical room, uh, feeding 21 buildings. And the, it was the largest in Europe, and I'm not sure it is now, but it could be still. And the Rome project uh, was called the name the Delias. Uh, the architect named the uh, the architects in in Europe, in Italy too, is they're like rock stars. Uh, you know, whenever there's a big building going on, they name the architect even before they name the building. This is located the 10 kilowatts uh, northeast of the Colosseum. Uh, 21 mid-sized elegant buildings of a thousand plus apartments and 22 commercial centers. Uh, we use 200, 200 plus wells, 200 meters deep. In Europe, they always use W, two U's, U bends in the ground instead of one. Usually pick up 15 to 20% more capacity. In this case, uh, the capacity for this project, because of the, some diversity, it was in the area of uh, 1.5 megawatt. The estimated savings is between 50% and 70% in heating, 50% in cooling and 70% in heating. So this is the the uh, the campus of buildings, uh, centralized, one pool, and these are a very, very elegant uh, project. If you ever are in uh, in Rome, you may want to go and take a look at it. So the the uh, protagonist here was the uh, uh, the owner uh, developer Barbara Marzaroma. Uh, we had a lot of help from a local uh, engineer Giuseppe Giuseppini, Sergio uh, Giuseppini, uh, Paolo Portuguese, the rock star architect, and the rock star geothermal guy is me over here. So. so. This is under construction. You see the buildings going up with the cranes, and these are the these are the uh, these are the boreholes and connections. So it's 1.2 megawatts in cooling, 1.5 megawatt in heating. Again, 213 probes W and 200 meters deep. When we first uh, went uh, and do a test hole in Rome, um, I flew there to take a look, uh, making sure the test hole was done right, only to find out that there was some people with uh, brushes and and trowels, you know, doing the excavating, the archaeologists. And I was terrified that all of this money, all this work uh, was gone for naught because they'd be there for years. But apparently what they've done is they, they located uh, some Roman era earth carriages tracks. They uh, cataloged it, took pictures of it, and then allowed us to drill. This is uh, 2006, if you look at the... Again, these are district heating, two th district geothermal, 2006. And today, N-Wave is doing district geothermal 2023. So we were a little bit ahead of our curve. So the on the bottom right, bottom right, you see the test hole that we put the conductivity test there in 2007. Again, we we're using conductivity test for a long time. And the on the top left, you will see dual motor, dual rotary geothermal uh, drilling machines, which we eventually brought to Canada in 2008. And uh, now the geothermal dual rotary is being used all over the, our area here because uh, you know it allows us to do a whole a day or maybe a whole and a half a day. Before that, we were doing a whole a week. See the uh, pipes in the ground. These are electric fusion, the dual rotary, dual uh, U bands in the ground. 
the uh, okay, you can see the pipes. Now there are all these pipes are all coming into a mechanical room underneath one of the buildings. So one of the buildings is 10,000 square feet uh, large and all these pipes now are coming into at the bottom of one of the buildings. And on top there's 10 stores on top. These are the manifolds that were fabricated and were put together. These are circulating pumps. The quality of work in, in Europe, and not just Italy, but in Europe in general, is phenomenal. It's just uh, you can eat off the floor. So this is a, we did we did this on a design build. So we had to take charge of the whole thing, including all the piping and everything else here. So we uh, it was just one person. They only want one person to be responsible for the whole thing. In this particular case, we're using uh, 400 ton to 500 ton Daikin central chillers and heat pumps. And we use both Daikin and Carrier. The, the, the Carrier, Daikin was built in Rome and the Carrier was built in France. You can see it's very well done. It's, uh, we didn't do it, we subcontract this part. There's our engineer and those are the uh, Flow, flow gauges, flow valves. This is a cogen, a German cogen that uh, they use as a as a backup for uh, for heat, and also use the use the discharge heat for cooling. I'll show you that later. So this cogen uses uh, diesel. But the diesel is made from a plant-based oil as fuel. Uh, it's called Jatropa carcass plant. Um, it grows in South America, Africa, and South Asia in, uh, in deserts. It, le it needs very little water. So the cogen hot water goes into the absorption system and creates chilled water. This is our very important collaborator, Mark Colossi, he's a project manager, a project partner in this thing. And also on the left side, you'll see the metering for each apartment. The, uh, the skipper on the top left, these are He's our co collaborator. He's the engineer of record for uh, for the project. He's he's not our engineer, but he's also a skipper, and uh, he goes to the regattas most of the time. So, also, I want to pay tribute to the people that um, taught us a few things. Um, Paul Mogensen from Sweden is the top left. We worked with him in, back in '85 in a baby hill project. And uh, at that time he had just introduced the idea of uh, uh, conductivity testing. So he's the, he's the founder of conductivity testing. Uh, top right, so you have Jim Bose. Bose has, has been a really, you know, expert founder, is being a big giant in geothermal. A combination of marketing and engineering. So he uh, he basically got all got 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 all, us all excited. And in fact, um, geothermal used to be called ground source heat pump. Uh, most of the time, geo exchange. He then proposed, uh, along with others, proposed to use geothermal. And uh, some of us were backing the idea because it was not pure. But probably one of the best things that happened is to use the geothermal because it kind of puts us in a, in a good spot. The bottom right is uh, our Dr. Otto's back. You heard about the slinky, but this is he did the he invented the vertical slinky. And the bottom left uh, is uh, is Professor Hooper just passed away last year. Professor Hooper did the re did the uh, research. Uh, he's a professor at U of T. He did research on geothermal as far back from 1948 to 51. 
and for the Toronto Power Authority. And when they found out in a speech, he mentioned when they found out the geotherm was so good, they shut down the research. So anyways, that's, um, that's all I have for now. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And you guys have a good day. Thank you very much, Gino. You know, it was very interesting. Um, really, really cool to see the the range of applications and um, how how long uh, we've been using this for, actually. Um, so we'll move on to uh, the presentation from uh, Jeff Hunter from Evolved Thermal, uh, which will be our last speaker for today. Uh, so please start thinking about uh, your questions and popping them in the chat there, because we'll have a good amount of time at the end to uh, answer them. Uh, Jeff, whenever you're ready. Um... Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Just trying to share my screen, and it's giving oh, me a... Sure. Uh, uh, Gino, can you just end the uh, share there? Absolutely. Yeah, I have to end. Otherwise, you can't go in. Okay. How do I end? Is it, is it done? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sure. So. Two. There we go. All right. Thank you, everybody. Great presentations to start. So uh, hopefully I can continue the trend. Um, so yeah, my name is Jeff Hunter. I'm with Evolved Thermal Energy. Just to give you a bit of background here as to why I'm here to chat with you. Um, what I do every day is we engage with contractors and with consumers to help them. Uh, interact with heat pumps out in the field, mostly for retrofitting existing homes, but also for uh, new home construction. Our mission in life at Evolved is to help uh, two things, help bring more contractors into the space because, you know, both as uh, municipalities, as provinces, and as the Canadian government, we've made some significant commitments to electrification. So there's a lot of work ahead of us. So we need a lot more people uh, doing a lot more electrification projects. So part of our role here is to bring more people in and then also to connect directly with consumers um, and predominantly happens to be in the rural areas because that's where we're focused with uh, our ground source system. So connecting with consumers and helping them understand what their options are in the uh, vastness of electrification and heat pump uh, heat pumps out there. So uh, that's kind of where we focus and, and how I've somewhat framed my presentation here around that context. Um, one thing I want to think about, or maybe put in the back of your head here as we go through the presentation, and it'll make more sense as I, as I get into it, um, you know, the individual homeowner, and in the, at, at, I guess in, in some sense, mostly in retrofits, but in new construction as well, like custom new construction, that individual homeowner is making uh, the decision on the energy systems that they're, uh, that's, they're going to put into their home and what's right for their home at that point in time, they're making that decision. And that is a pretty long-term decision in most cases. We've heard, uh, I think it came up conventional systems, you know, a typical lifespan, 15 years, geothermal heat pumps, 20, 25 years, plus the loop is, you know, it's a generational type thing. So it's a long-term decision. And so the homeowner is making that based on what they have, what information they have in front of them. Uh, that's a significant commitment, not just for the homeowner, but also for the community and the rural communities and what the community is looking for um, from the energy systems that are occurring in the community might not actually align with what the homeowner is looking for, right? Um, so in rural communities, as we're looking down this vastness of the electrification process, uh, we need to start encouraging, and we are, I think I saw a uh, chat about the Greener Homes Program. That's a federal program to help encourage people's direction uh, in electrification of their space conditioning systems. But there needs to be more programming tuned towards um, how and where and what communities want to see homeowners engage into. Uh, so, I mean, one of the examples is, you know, just because a farm down the street has been screaming for years for, for methane, a natural gas uh, doesn't mean we bring that methane to that farm and, and force that natural gas upon the community members, uh, maybe single family homes that might be in the area and say, okay, well, here's natural gas for you. Now we've locked them into long-term commitments because of uh, something that's needed at a farm down the street. So 
energy is something that infects the entire community and seizing our green energy um, economy opportunities uh, is something that we should be uh, taking a look at and I'm sure is why you're here today to take a look at our presentation. So let us get into it. And as we get into it, I'm going to take a step back and just let's go totally simple. So what what is energy? And you know, we heard the explanation from Matt on how geothermal systems work, transferring energy from the ground. Um, but back to basics, what, what is it actually in? It, what actually is it? And how would we describe that? Well, in terms of thermal, uh, thermodynamics, energy is really the capacity of a system to do work or to transfer heat. And in the context of what we're talking about here, and, and I'm looking at rural residential focus, um, we're talking about furnaces and water heaters that have that capacity to do work. And we heard some numbers from Matt as far as um, tons and BTUs. I think we saw that a couple of times. And for those of us that are familiar with the furnaces in our house, we might be familiar with BTUs per hour. And that's typically how we size our heating equipment. So this furnace we could say is a 100,000 BTU per hour uh, furnace. That means that that furnace can produce 100,000 BTUs of thermal energy or heat over the course of one hour. Now the actual output of that furnace is gonna be reflected more by its efficiency. So we, we learned from Matt as well that, um, uh, and he gave them a good efficiency rating of 98%. And so that's a sticker rating. That furnace at 98% can convert 98% uh, of that 100,000 BTUs into usable heat into the space. So uh, that's one way to look at it. The other way is to say that, you know, what we're actually doing with that furnace is trying to extract the chemical energy that's stored in the natural gas that we're feeding or propane or fuel oil, whatever, and convert, we're converting that chemical energy into useful thermal energy at that rate of 100,000 BTUs per hour. And of course, that thermal energy is then transferred into the home, into the ductwork system, or if we're using a hydronic system, it's into uh, radiators or in-floor or whatnot makes its way around the house. So the capacity to do work in that case is the furnace's ability to generate uh, sufficient thermal energy to maintain that comfortable indoor environment, overcoming the heat loss of the building that happens. Uh, heat travels from high to low. So it's moving through the walls, windows, and doors uh, as it gets colder outside. Now, the more efficient that the furnace is converting that chemical energy in the natural gas to thermal energy, the better its capacity to maintain a comfortable temperature inside the home. So we use BTU hours because that's pretty standard in the HVAC industry, uh, in North America anyways, to rate the capacity of our systems and how they convert that energy. But we can also look at that in other units. Uh, if you remember from, I forget what class this would have been in school, but science class, maybe units, metric. When we talk about metric and imperial units, so we can convert BTUs out per hour into a more familiar form, uh, which is kilowatt hours. And a lot of us, uh, if we're homeowners, we're familiar with kilowatt hours because we pay it. Well, that's how we pay our electricity bill. We see what our kil kilowatt hour usage is every month and we pay our bill based on that. So it's no different than that. It's another way of describing the energy that we're using. And so to create that um, sort of consistency, heat pumps, and this was already explained, but heat pumps don't convert chemical energy, right? We're not combusting a fuel in the heat pump. All we're doing is transferring heat. We're moving it from one place to another, which of course is that secondary side of that description of what energy is, the capacity to do work or the capacity to transfer heat. Mm -hmm. And again, we can rate this ener energy transfer uh, in BTUs per hour or in kilowatt hours that are delivered to the home. And we'll take a closer look at that here shortly. In rural Ontario, and I noticed there's some folks from other parts of Canada, I apologize, I'm just uh, my, I'm in an Ontario frame of mind at the moment, but um, in rural Canada, we've got different ways to uh, provide energy to our homes. Um, you've heard of distributed energy resources possibly with respect to utility companies and how they're looking at their utility grids and different sources of energy generation. While this is distributed energy storage, right? We're, we've got some sort of storage system at point of use and a few times through the year, we're gonna fill that up and that fuel or that, uh, that fuel is gonna sit there until we need it, until we need to convert it 
to the thermal energy that we need in the home. Now, the energy, I've got wood shown there because uh, we use quite a bit of wood still. And actually 40% of the world's population still uses wood. So it's it's a significant number. But in, in Ontario, I'm going to show you some numbers here. It's a little different, but there's a lot of energy in wood, not just in the wood, the content of the fuel in the wood when you combust it. But, and I always hear this when I go to farm shows, how much energy is actually in wood? And if I ask you, well, it's the energy in cutting down the tree. Uh, it's the energy to move the logs from where I cut down the tree to where I'm going to split the logs. It's the energy to split the logs. It's the energy to stack the logs. And then it's the energy to move the logs into the stove or into the fireplace. So there's a lot of energy in wood. Now, there's a few downsides, of course, when we look at our energy systems in the rural area like this. Uh, we've got some risk here. And we saw it in the last couple of years with the higher cost of the commodity, right? We saw propane prices and fuel oil prices uh, skyrocket. They're very volatile, unstable. And in our rural communities, the way that we thrive and grow is to make our communities as competitive as possible. So we need to give them the cheapest form of energy as possible. But now we also have to balance that with the most environmentally um, uh, responsible decisions for our energy systems as well. Here we also have some risks. You know, there's higher costs and emissions in transporting that fuel to site. So we don't have a, a connected grid to get that fuel to site. So we have to drive it there. And that has some risks in it. Fuel oil is, of course, a, a very dirty fuel. And there, I think Matt mentioned some insurance and risks there with uh, storing that fuel oil on site. So some um, considerations to our conventional rural energy systems. Uh, I might hear somebody there. Sorry. Jeff, can I uh, just interject for a second? Uh, are you, I'm not sure if we're on the same slide. Uh, we're, I'm still seeing rural thermal energy sources is the slide that's on. Yep, I haven't switched yet. I'm just about to make okay. that switch. Yeah. No problem. Thanks. It was just in that process. Sorry, I heard a, I heard a noise and it set me off. Um, so here we go. Um, looking at Ontario's rural home heating, how does it look? So what we've done is we've cut out all of the homes in Ontario that are on natural gas. And we're just looking at the ones that are not connected to the gas grid. So if we looked at that today, this is 2019 data. Um, we've got about 365,000 fuel oil systems, uh, 745 electric systems, 745,000, uh, about 400,000 heat pumps. And that would be air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps and a mixture there. Uh, we've got wood. And then we also have a whole bunch of hybrid systems in rural senses where people do wood oil or wood propane or wood electric, that amounts to another 260,000 systems. So uh, you can see quite a quite a mash of different fuel systems here, lots of electric, um, lots of heat pumps growing over the last number of years. Oil still makes up a good chunk as well. So what is the answer then to transition energy systems from that um, disconnected method and those other fuels. And typically it is this, or it has been this. And we've seen a lot of this in the last number of years. This is a, um, I don't know what you would call this, if it's a feeder pipeline, it's a larger gas pipeline, right? So we're connecting communities to the natural gas grid to solve that energy uh, challenge. And that gets them onto the centralized grid presumably to lower those costs, the lowest point. And we can see the trends in Ontario. This is Ontario data. Uh, residential natural gas growth over the last 20 years, um, starting in 2000, you can see how we've, we've got high efficiency furnaces, uh, medium efficiency starting to come down there, and our standard efficiency. So this would be below 90%. We've made that effective uh, transition there. So this is going to include new community developments, new home developments in urban areas. It's all of Ontario, but also rural gas expansion where we're adding new homes to that grid. Now, one of the challenges is the hidden costs, and maybe they're not so hidden depending on where you sit and your perspective. Um, maybe I'm thinking kind of from the consumer's point of view, the hidden costs of natural gas expansion. And this, uh, I'm quoting this from uh, the OCAC, OCAA, Ontario Clean Air Alliance, had a report out not too long ago that actually referenced a uh, OEB proceeding in 2016 in which the Ontario Geothermal Association was an intervener 
And we learned that the cost for a rural gas expansion to move pipelines into these new communities uh, per home in 2016 was about $27,000. So it's like half a million dollars today. I'm just kidding. That's not that bad. Probably over $30,000 with inflation. So a considerable cost in there per meter. Now, it's important to understand that that's to the meter of the home. When we're retrofitting a system, let's say they had a fuel oil system in there before, we've got some equipment needs on the inside of the home, so new furnace, new water heater. Uh, if it was electric baseboard, maybe we have to do a ductwork system or whatnot. So those costs bring us right to the meter. Now that expansion and those costs are gonna be paid for by the existing customer base, you and I in different areas of Ontario with surcharges, and then additional surcharges to new customers, in some cases for terms up to 40 years, uh, on top of the gas commodity rate. And we've seen examples of that um, usually after these expansion projects are, are done. And we saw examples in um, Oak Worth Lakes, Fenelon Falls, North Bay, where consumers get their first bills. It's like, whoa, whoa wait a minute. I have to, I've got a 23 cent per cubic meter surcharge on top of this. So those are things to be considerate of and sometimes don't make it, the message doesn't make it all, all its way through to consumers until it's after done, it, it's all done. So there are significant costs in getting homes connected to the gas grid. And when I look at gas rates today, um, obviously over the last couple of years with what's been happening on the commodities market, we've seen some significant increases in just the price of the commodity. Um, I've seen on average somewhere around 65 cents a cubic meter. And we have to consider, and just to preface that, you know, as the consumer, how much am I paying for my energy? And it's not just the gas supply cost. To me, as the consumer, it's how many dollars am I taking out of my pocket and how much energy am I getting in return? So I'm including everything that we have in those numbers, our taxes, everything in. And when I look at my own bill, I'm in that 65 to 70 cents a cubic meter range. If we were going to be in an expansion case, now we would have to add another 23 cents a cubic meter on top of that. So there's a lot going into that number. As far as the projects go, we also know that we see uh, provincial grants, municipal funding, um, and other sources of uh, subsidies to help make those projects economical. Now, and I'm gonna come back to economics and numbers here in a minute, but if we're fuel switching and the point is to reduce emissions, um, this I got from the Rural Ontario Institute uh, Foresight Papers 2019, I thought it was an interesting comment. Reducing emissions by fuel switching is not the complete answer. Rural areas that don't currently have access to natural gas will drop their CO2 emissions when gas becomes available and homeowners switch from propane and oil, but that will only reduce a small amount, energy use a small amount due to the availability of more efficient heating systems. So you're gonna get a bit of a net benefit because the fuel is presumably cleaner, though there may be an argument there with propane. Um, but the energy use reduction is not coming down. And that's something that ground source heat pump systems with their ground heat exchanger can really uh, benefit that equation. And we'll speak to that here, I think, on this slide. So I don't want to confuse this. Um, and putting up a chart with numbers is a little bit risky as far as losing our point in perspective. But when we talked about what is energy and talking about um, equating that all to kilowatt hours, getting us onto the same playing field, right? I can talk about a furnace that's on natural gas, a furnace that's on propane or fuel oil, and relate that all back to energy as kilowatt hours. And that's what we've done in this chart. We know how much energy is in a liter of oil. We know how much energy is in a, um, a liter of propane. We know how much energy is in a cubic meter of uh, natural gas. And that's what we've listed out here. How do we get that down to a common term so that we can get a real frame of reference of what is the lowest cost of energy uh, when we're operating our systems? And we can see fuel oil number two, just for an example, uh, we've got 40,000 BTUs per hour per liter of fuel oil, accounting for the efficiency of the typical equipment, uh, non-condensing. We Get ourselves down to about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, this is assuming oil at a buck 85. We certainly saw higher than that in the last couple of years. 
um, propane at 90 cents. So as we line all that up, we can start to see where ground source heat pumps fit as far as cost for the energy that they're delivering. And you can clearly see ground source heat pumps being the lowest cost per kilowatt hour. Now, something that certainly has come into the marketplace over the last uh, decade is air source heat pumps and cold climate air source heat pumps. And how do they fit into this conversation? And I've positioned them with two data points here because often consumers in rural areas are going to see information about ground source heat pump, about cold climate air source heat pumps that rate them at this performance level. And I've shown two and a half here because there's marketing from manufacturers on equipment and then there's what actually happens in the field. Now, two and a half, we're talking about 250% efficient. So we put one kilowatt hour into it, we get two and a half kilowatt hours out of it. Those are in pretty typical conditions, but we also see in conditions that are peak. So in those not so good situations that happen every year, those colder situations, or even in those ultra warm situations, the performance of air source equipment is going to suffer because we're using that air as that heat exchange uh, medium. And I can highlight that uh, just to take a look here, an example, of a manufacturer's data sheet. Now I'm only showing the heating side of it, but you can get a feel for how the performance of the sy system changes over time. As the outdoor temperature drops, so too does the performance. So when I had two and a half on this particular equipment, it would be right around uh, zero or one degree uh, Celsius. So, you know, perhaps it's not so much a problem for the individual consumer, because the consumer may get used to the fact that at a certain temperature, a backup system may need to turn on. They may not notice the difference between, you know, a 1.4 COP and a 1.7. Um, but it does have an imp a larger impact on the broader scale. And again, this is manufactured data. And this is one of the challenges that I see in the marketplace is, you know, we're talking about this information and this data was extracted from the manufacturer that makes the equipment in indoor, uh, I shouldn't say indoor, in test lab conditions where things are set up to figure out how that equipment performs. So this may not be the performance of the system after it is installed. And certainly it may not be the performance of the system after year one, year five. What about year 10? We're expecting these systems to last in the range of 10 to 15 years. So the, these are some of the unfortunate circumstances that are occurring in the marketplace today is that the realities and how these systems are presented um, needs to be presented in the right specifics. Now we're starting to see more studies come out of actual field test data on this equipment, but we're still just typically seeing, you know, after one year of operation, what does it look like? To compare that then uh, to geothermal. Now this is field test data, and this is a shot from actually a water furnace brand piece of equipment. They have a, a very nice interface called the uh, uh, symphony system. And so the homeowner can see exactly what kind of energy that they're using. And here, this is real-time data based on, now this is from 2019 because I had it in a slide. Uh, this was Hamilton, Ontario, outdoor air temperature minus 15 Celsius, what we can expect. We can see the system is performing with a COP of about four and a half. So this is a really well-performing system in this situation. How does that tie together when we're looking at uh, comparative between these systems? This chart, I think, does a really good job of putting it all on the same framework. We've got an air source piece of equipment, uh, a coal climate air source heat pump. We've got a gas furnace, and then we've got a typical two-stage ground source heat pump. Now, the ground source is in green at the bottom, lowest energy dam uh, demand. And what we're looking at here is basically the peak conditions in this particular location of the year. Now, we've got ground source down here, the air source heat pump over here, and then the gas uh, furnace, they've equated again back to kilowatt hours, right? So we've got on the same plane of how much energy is being consumed here. This has a big impact on our utility grids uh, because we don't design utility grids for when things are running great. 
you design them for those peak design days. And so you can see, you know, if if we're expecting our equipment to be installed all air source systems, it's going to have a significant impact on how we approach the investments into that utility infrastructure. Now, pulling back to the typical consumer again and what they see uh, on the operating cost side. Now, I've estimated a pretty standard home. I've used those same fuel rates here. So we're talking 65, um, 90 cents a liter for propane, uh, 65 cents a liter natural gas, a buck 85 for oil. Uh, so that might fluctuate some, but you can see the considerable difference in the price points here on the different systems. So there's oil being the worst case scenario and propane. Now from, uh, I think I saw somebody mention a question about greener homes and payback and how that factors in. The greener homes program obviously is providing um, funding and retrofit to consumers directly to, to um, retrofit their homes from fossil fuel to an electrified system. If you look at the difference in cost and operating cost, and let's just compare a geo to an oil system, uh, there's a savings there in this case, you know, it's not quite 5,000 bucks. So it's significant. And so that's where it ties back to what Matt had said in his first presentation um, with respect to five-year paybacks. If you're saving close to $5,000 a year, you can pay back um, a system in a relatively quick amount of time. Propane is the same case. We're saving about 2,400 bucks a year. So if you take that savings in year after year, uh, and then also assume the commodity cost increase of the other fuels, uh, um, that can be a that can provide a significant return on investment. Then, if we look at the case of natural gas, so the only thing that really changed there, slightly more for natural gas, because now we've added that additional 23 cents per cubic meter on the rural expansion situation. So we are rural communities are paying a little bit more natural gas than we would in other areas. So what does that mean from a community energy standpoint? And I, I grabbed this from, I live in Waterloo Region. I was familiar with this report. Uh, this is from the Waterloo Region Community Energy Investment Strategy document. And so these are all the energy inputs into the region that are told together, the different fuels. Um, and I'm pretty sure folks on the call probably have similar documents. If you've done your community energy planning, this might fit it into your documents. Um, so it doesn't specifically show us what the residential energy source fuel consumption is, but we can estimate that a sizable portion of some of these energy inputs to the region are for our buildings and relate to space conditioning and water heating. Now, obviously, there's a rural regions around. Uh, Waterloo region itself, but most of the region is serviced by natural gas. More rural communities will probably have um, a higher weighted propane and fuel oil input into the region. And so what does this mean? I want to pull this back, uh, and I'm wrapping up here, um, pulling this back to the ground loop and what uh, Matt had said in his first presentation the fact that the ground loop, and we've got a bit of a range here, um, but basically we're getting, you know, 400% efficiency. Let's split that uh, one kilowatt in, four units out. And 70% of that is the free energy that's coming in the form of renewable thermal energy from our ground loop. And I think I heard Agino say this too. So that's on-site uh, hyper-local energy that's available 365 days a year uh, on the flip of a switch, zero emissions right in your backyard. So we've got to think about that when we're looking at those inputs energy from our to our community. Um, now we're not going out of our community to feed the energy in. We're building the infrastructure within our community, community jobs to build that infrastructure, design and uh, analysis and all of that construction. And then the energy is here on site within the community. So that really benefits the economy overall. And so that's something to think about here, because to go back to these pictures, we have energy infrastructure, which is the gas grids uh, that we might consider bringing into our rural communities. But then we have energy and infrastructure with our geothermal systems, because the geothermal pipe is providing both. The gas pipe is just the infrastructure. You still have to buy the gas 
and you've got to buy enough of it to pay off the infrastructure investment. So I will leave it right there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. I, I definitely learned a lot. I think you you hit on a lot of um, a lot of things that are top of mind for a lot of our our, our audience here, um, uh, particularly around. Um, I think there is a common perception that uh, you know natural gas is perceived as being the cheapest option right now. So uh, I was really interested to see that cost comparison there. Uh, it was really really enlightening. Um, and excellent point about the. Uh, keeping those energy dollars in our communities um, you know, can't can't stress the benefits of of doing that enough. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up for uh, questions. Uh, we do have a few in the chat here, so I'll start with those. But um, please uh, encourage you to take advantage of having this uh, wealth of knowledge here. Uh, I know many of you are considering ground source heat pumps and geothermal systems in your communities. Uh, so please uh, take advantage of the opportunity to ask any questions you may have. Uh, while we have these uh, experts in front of us. Um, the first question um, we have here uh, from uh, Melissa Halford. Uh, so we have a subdivision in our municipality that used to have wells and septics, but these were replaced with municipal piped water and sewer some time ago. Could residents in that neighborhood use their old wells on their lots and repurpose them for geothermal? Uh, anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, to Matt, I can answer that if you'd like, or at least give my two cents. Um, from a heat pump perspective, I don't see why you couldn't, um, as long as, as I had mentioned, you've got water of sufficient quantity, and, and that's not a mystery. It might not be known now, but all major manufacturers publish water quality data, basically saying the water quality needs to meet this specification to be suitable for our heat exchangers. And then the other thing is to make sure that you've got sufficient amounts of, of water, the three to 10 gallons per minute. Um, the one thing that is probably going to be an additional cost or would be required that isn't there now, um, and I don't hold myself out as, as a well expert, but I do understand open loop systems, those that use well water directly, used to be much more popular, you know, 20 years ago before things were regulated. So it was cheap and easy to pull water out of a well and dump it to a runoff ditch or a ravine or wherever you wanted. Whereas now it's more regulated in the sense that you don't need permission to take water in Ontario for residential geothermal use, but the expectation is that you will put it back into the aquifer you're taking it out of, and that requires an injection well. So that's an additional cost and it's not always an insignificant cost. And my other understanding is it's easier to take water out of a well often than it is to put it back. So 20 years ago, yeah, you probably could have just run the water through the heat pump as long as there was enough and it was suitable quality and then just dump it wherever. Whereas now you've got the well as a source, but you're going to have to likely invest in the cost of an injection well. I don't know what that cost is, but it, it would be something to consider. But as far as could you use well water? Yeah, in all likelihood you could. We've done a few well water systems. Uh, this is Gino from Ground Heat. We did a few water well, well, well systems, uh, uh, some of them being some of the smaller ones. If you use less than 10,000 uh, liters a day, which is a small, very small house, then basically you can do what they used to call pump and dump. But if you use more than that, uh, then you have to have a secondary well, to, like, you said, like Matthew says, to put it back in the ground. And plus you have to have a permit. <clears throat> so the permit, is costly as well. Probably costs as much as the well. So in they're trying to discourage uh, water from uh, dumping and, uh, uh, but that's that's the the reality of it. So ten thousand liters a day is not much, but for a small house it'd be okay. Great, thank you. Um, so the the next question. Um, Trevor Donald was asking if um, someone can speak to uh, your experiences with the Greener Homes Grant. I know uh, Jeff touched on this briefly, but I was wondering if there was any um, anything else anyone wanted to add uh, to that um, in terms of 
uh, experience implementing uh, that program? Um, like how, how has it been going uh, utilizing that that grant? What what are some of the um, like challenges and benefits of, of it so far? Yeah, can, can I? Yeah. Um, so from I guess from from the homeowner's perspective, uh, it seems to be working good. I mean, other than the normal uh, sense of timelines, you know, sometimes those programs are they don't work, they don't move too quickly. Uh, but from an industry standpoint, yeah, it's certainly attracted homeowners' attention and getting things moving as far as making the, the transition. One of the things, and I, I wish I had touched on it in the presentation, I think I thought I was going to, but um, uh, with those types of overarching programs, there's a lot of moving pieces. And one of the un unfortunate things is it doesn't really, in this case, it doesn't really recognize the oversized benefit that ground source systems are providing to the marketplace relative to air source. I think there was a question on air source as well. I slightly touched on air source a bit. There's a lot more benefit with a ground source system because of the uh, infrastructure, right? A ground source system isn't just a mechanical piece of equipment that wears out and depreciates over time. It's energy infrastructure that's in the ground that appreciates over time as that energy cost or the alternate energy cost gets more expensive, right? So that's a variable, va very valuable resource. Unfortunately, Greener Homes doesn't recognize the difference between the two. And so it rates as far as rebate values. Uh, you get the same rebate for an air source system as you do for a ground source system. So policymakers really need to tune these systems to make them better fit what's providing more value in the marketplace. So that would be my only concern with the program at this point, And maybe that, that works its way out in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you for those insights, Jeff. And that actually reminds me of the um, the uh, report that the OGA and uh, Dunsky did on the um, actually the uh, utility benefits of uh, ground source heat pumps, as you alluded to in your presentation as well. Um, when we're looking at transitioning to uh, clean electricity goods, especially with the recent federal budget announcement for investments in renewable energy, um, we need to be you, uh, the mass amount of electrification and ground source heat pumps are gonna be a lot more efficient. You're gonna put a lot less grid, uh, a lot less constraints on the grid, a lot, a lot less pressure on electricity grid, reducing peak demand. So I encourage you to check out the report. I'll pop it in the chat here when I have a uh, chance, but um, a really, really good uh, other uh, economic case for ground source heat pumps at a higher level. Um, the next question, we had um, another one from uh, Trevor Donald. How does hybrid natural gas and air source heat pump compare to just having a ground source heat pump? Uh, if anyone would have any insights on that. Uh, maybe could I ask for clarification in, in, in what way, like an environmental greenhouse gas impact or a cost of operation impact? Can Trevor clarify that? Uh, yeah, Trevor, uh, feel free to unmute if you wish, uh, or just pop it in the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. So I was on talks, I guess, maybe one to two years ago, and the big selling, I guess, that Enbridge was doing at the time was um, uh, having your natural gas furnace, and then with um, what they were calling like a highly sophisticated air source heat pump that would work in combination. And so that was touted as like the next big thing. And to be honest, till today, I wasn't even aware um, the ground source system even existed. So <laughs> this is very informative. Uh, well, I'm glad you can make it, Trevor. Uh, Matt, if you want to. Yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, and I don't want to hold myself out as a natural gas air source heat pump expert. I, I would say, and I think Jeff and Gino would agree with me. Um, air source heat pumps have come a long way in the past 10 or 20 years. Having cold climate air source heat pumps that have, you know, decent performance of a COP of 1.5 down to minus 25 is, is an improved air source heat pump. Um, but I would also point to Jeff's, um, that chart that outlined the load on the grid. Um, now, obviously, the electrical load on the coldest day of the year is reduced if you're backing it up with gas, by backing it up with gas, you're you're not really accommodating 
are moving towards the, the this decarbonization of the electricity grid. Um, I would say, and I'm biased for geo, but geothermal is the best way, most efficient um, and most carbon neutral way to provide heating and cooling space conditioning to a house. I'm also under no illusions that we're about to retrofit the entire downtown core of the GTA with geothermal heat pumps. There's just, it's not gonna be possible to drill everywhere. You've got subway lines, infrastructure, tiny lots. That is where I see densely populated urban areas where cold climate air source heat pumps are going to have something to offer. Now, whether you back them up with natural gas, you could make the claim that if they're already on gas, putting an air source heat pump on is reducing gas, but it'll never eliminate it. Whereas if you back it up electrically, you're eliminating the gas, but now you're dealing with larger infrastructure peaks on the coldest days of the year. Um, and from a cost benefit, what I said for as long as I can remember, and I've been doing this for 20 years, Anytime someone is inquiring about geothermal and they currently have natural gas, the first thing I say to them is you are going to need more than financial motivation to justify that cost. Just because even when the price of, you know, when I did geo 17 years ago, I cut my gas bill, well, my energy bill by over half, right? I went from 1200 bucks a year on gas to 500 bucks a year on geo, but it's, it's a 60% savings of not very much. So when you're saving $700 a year, it takes much longer to offset your capital cost than it does when you're going from oil to geo saving $5,000 a year. Um, so I, I think it depends on, are you looking at a purely financial aspect? Are you looking at a decarbonization aspect? And is geothermal even um, a realistic or a reasonable thing to consider installing where you live? Can you get a drill rig onto the property to do the drilling needed? Because if you're not on a rural lot close to an acre or more, a horizontal loop is by all practical means not an option for you. Is that helpful, Trevor? Yeah. So uh, let me let me step in a bit. I um, my background is with the General Electric uh, heat pumps. Now it's uh, was bought by a train, so now it's a train heat pump. I used to be the service and training manager for Canada. And training on how to, you know, cooling the uh, rooftop units, the gas, electric, everything, including, including heat pumps. And heat pumps was at that time GE had the best heat pump in uh, in North America. And uh, now heat pumps have come a long way. I'm not quite sure, not sure how how long. But all I know is that when I was a service manager, uh, we had issues with defrost. Uh, we had different issues with the equipment failing because defrost takes a big a big hit every time it defrosts. And defrost could be either on a pressure different system or it could be on a time system. It could be one and a half times, uh, uh, once every one and a half hours. Now, if you have gas backup, chances are you have less of a problem because in defrost, what it does, it goes into an air conditioning mode for a short period of time until it melts, until it melts the ice from the the walls of the case of the uh, of the box. So I I would like to, like uh, like Matthew and Jeff and you guys. I like this. Well, I would hope that uh, air source heat pumps are doing well because you know you're right. You can't drill everywhere. Uh, however, keep in mind that there's a lot of you know, these these systems don't don't last long. You know they last like, uh, 12, 10, 12 years. And if they have done a good job now, I really hope so because I went into geothermal because I just, I thought in, in Canada, air source was hopeless. Uh, except for Leamington and uh, and uh, Victoria, BC, uh, you go into snow areas, wind areas like today, um, the defrost is, is gonna be running constantly. And uh, the pressure that the compressor runs into goes from, you know, for those of you who are in mechanics, it goes to 150 psi down to 350 psi. When you reverse uh, reverse the uh, the pressure, the, the the compressor does fail more often. So, anyways, I like you guys. Uh, I think it's air source is better than gas. I hope uh, they do have a better machine, a better uh, now. But I have uh, nightmares of uh, of the days back uh, in my young days.
Thank, um, thank you, Gino and Matt. Um, yeah, it's. I think um, you know both uh, air and ground both have um, important roles to play in the in the transition. Um, they both have their uh, their place. But um, so yeah, thank you for those insights. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question here as we're kind of running out of time. Um, so from uh, Olivia Gruff, uh, I was wondering what are the common issues or typical maintenance um, associated with uh, these types of systems, so geosystems in specific? Um, geothermal systems broadly or open loop systems or closed loop? Uh, I think the question is more broadly, but uh, Olivia, feel free to uh, clarify if you like. Yeah, just, well, just, just broadly would be great. Okay. Um, well, it's it's a pretty short answer for for closed loop systems. Clean your air filter, um, because geothermal systems are moving more air than a gas furnace, and because they're doing it at a lower temperature, and because they're doing it with a refrigeration system as opposed to a combustion appliance, um, they are more sensitive to airflow restriction. Um, now they've got all sorts of sensors built in and, and the system will lock itself out and tell you what the issue is. Um, but the main thing is keep your filter clean. Um, and as I think I mentioned in my presentation, I would recommend an annual checkup, not because it's like an oil change in a car, whereas if you don't do it, the engine's gonna you know, fall apart and rot and have all sorts of issues. Um, you could not maintain a system for 10 years outside of a filter and there's really no reason to be concerned my advice is just if you get it checked in October, if there is an issue, I think it's better to identify it in October as opposed to, um, you know, middle of the night in January, because I can pretty much guarantee your heat pump is not going to break down on the nicest mile to stay in January, right? If there's an issue, it's probably going to pop up when it's cold and working hard. Um, the only other potential maintenance issue would be on an open loop system. And again, that would depend largely on your water quality. Um, but an open loop system, I would definitely suggest an annual maintenance required just again to keep debris out of the heat exchanger um, and, and to be more proactive. That's one of the advantages of a closed loop system because it's closed and sealed. The loop side maintenance is, is really non-existent. The level of maintenance on an open loop system very much depends on what your water quality issues are, what type of debris or sediment or things you have in your water. Um, but outside of, of cleaning a heat exchanger on an open loop system and keeping a filter clean regardless, they are very low maintenance systems. Uh, if I could add a follow-up question, would um how about how common are like issues in the in the actual loops, like once they're installed in the ground? Um, so the only issues that would exist in the loop would either be um, if they weren't properly installed. So when I had mentioned the thermal fusion is really, really important to do properly. And that's not a black art. It's like there are, there are procedures and welding times and preparation and how to do welds properly. If that is done, there's really no issue with the loop unless it's dug up. Um, you know, I don't know anyone that's installing fence posts at six feet deep, um, but if you were to install a fence post or something at six feet deep and damage the loop, Yes, it would leak and yes, it can be repaired. It's just plastic pipe. So the damaged part would be cut out and then you'd weld in uh, a new section of pipe. The only other time that I'm aware of, of earth loops being an issue um, <clears throat> was there was a pipe manufacturer, I wanna say 15 or 20 years ago, um, where they manufactured pipe that failed. And the reason it failed is they were using recycled plastic as opposed to vir virgin resin. Um, as a cost saving measure. And um, yeah, that pipe failed catastrophically and, and it was terrible, which is why it's really important um, to make sure that the contractor you are hiring is buying quality pipe and they know what they're doing and they're doing the welds properly. But short of using defective product or, or um, you know, not following manufacturer's procedures on how to fuse and weld and assemble earth loops. Again, I'd go back to my comment that plastic is an ideal material for loops because it doesn't rust or oxidize or otherwise break down. It just sits there inert in the ground. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm not seeing any more uh, questions in the chat. Um, uh, so 
in the meantime, I will, I have one more question I would like to ask. Um, so this will be the last chance for anyone uh, here to um, pose a question. Uh, my question actually was, um, Matt, regarding your uh, presentation, you mentioned like um, the importance of optimizing the system. I was just wondering if, without getting too much into the nitty gritty technical, like what uh, what is actually meant by optimizing? Oh, so what I meant by optimizing is that you're installing a system that's appropriately sized for the space, right? So I remember um, when I started in geothermal about 20 years ago, we'd be pulling out 100,000 BTU gas furnaces and replacing them with, you know, a five ton heat pump that would be nominally rated for 60,000 BTUs, but on a 32 degree earth loop under design conditions in the winter, it's probably outputting, you know, maybe 48 or 50,000 BTUs. And I just kept thinking like, how are we replacing 100,000 BTUs with a 48,000 BTU heat pump? And it's because when you're buying a combustion appliance, whether it's a 60,000 BTU furnace, an 80,000 BTU furnace, or 100,000 BTU furnace, the price doesn't really matter. It's, it's not, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. There's not much of a spread because all you're buying is something that consumes fuel, right? Outside of how big the burner is, there's not a whole lot of difference to it. With a geothermal system, could we install a 100,000 BTU geothermal system? Absolutely we could. No one would ever buy it because it would be three times as expensive as it needs to be, right? That's when I say optimize, what I mean is I know that we are going to be a more expensive system than a conventional oil, propane, or natural gas system to install. Because as Jeff has also outlined and Gino's going over, it's not just a combustion appliance. It is an energy source in a system, right? So I would say if, for example, when you bought a propane furnace, if you had to buy a 20-year supply of natural gas, and at the end of that 20 years, if you bought too much, or sorry, propane, it expired, you probably wouldn't be so keen to install an oversized propane system, but that's not how you purchase a conventional system, right? You buy the appliance and just the fuel you need. With the geothermal system, because it's an energy source, you are forced to install that energy source up front. And if you oversize it, it just becomes prohibitively expensive and there's no real benefit to having three times the system that you need. Does that answer the question? Yeah, definitely. That was very, very clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, so I think it looks like we're about to um, to wrap up here. Um, so I just wanted to extend like a, a very warm thank you to our speakers for taking the time out of the day to uh, educate us on on these systems and the importance of them. Um, I think uh, just more of a comment from my end is that you know the uh, business case is only going to keep on getting uh, better for for these systems, as especially as the carbon price uh, starts uh, rising, and um, you know. I, a natural gas system built today is essentially locking you into that that decision for for quite some time. So, definitely um, encourage you all to to really consider the opportunities for these systems, especially in the the rural areas where you have, have a lot of space. And I hope uh, you took away um, a lot of great insights from this uh, presentation. Um, so, if there's no more uh, comments or questions, anyone wants to get in at the last second, uh, let's pause briefly. Great. Thank you very much for thank you very much for inviting us on this. I appreciate it, and it's a good they're good presentations, really. Yes, and yeah, thank you, Gino, for coming. Thank you all for coming, um, and thank everyone in the audience for being here. Um, as you know, uh, the Partners for Climate Protection program uh, continues to be here to support your climate action planning uh, needs and capacities. So please feel free to reach out to myself and my colleague Pavels. Uh, for any questions um, or about ground source heat pumps or any other uh, climate related topic. Uh, so thanks again for your time and um, hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.